morning. Um, as Mary said, our first speaker is John O'Regan. Uh, John is the main board director with uh, Davis Langdon. Uh, John is based in the Galway office of Davis Langdon, but has responsibilities for the Galway, Limerick and Cork offices. And his role is to ensure the delivery of a high quality project and cost management service for the three regional teams. Uh, John has over 25 years experience in the construction and property industry uh, and has been with Davis Langdon since 1995. Uh, as a chartered quantity surveyor, project and cost manager, John has extensive experience in the private and public sector and has played the lead role in the delivery of many complex construction projects. Uh, he has developed uh, over recent years a particular public sector expertise and specialism with a focus on the procurement of large and complex projects through traditional and PPP routes. Uh, John has been a very good friend of our conference, has been here from the start and uh, I could say he's uh, our anchor tenant and um, uh, John's traditionally now has, has set the scene for the rest of the day with a, a very detailed analysis of the construction industry and um, uh, overview in its present state and uh, hopefully review its future prospects. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was a serious introduction. Slightly worried about that. <laughs> the, uh, um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I would li I'd like to add my thanks to everybody, to Martin and to Mary, for setting up and annually running this conference. Um, it's an excellent occasion, and it's growing every year, and um, we've got some fast fantastic speakers today. So um, I'm looking forward to the full day. I think Martin's prob probably given the, uh, enough of an introduction to Davis Langdon, so I, w I won't carry on with the sales pitch. The, um, as Martin said, I'm going to look particularly at the, the industry and the Irish construction industry as it is now, um, and look at how some of the things that are going to influence it over the next number of coming years, because we are at a very interesting point in the industry at the moment. Um, so I'm going to look at the, the output of the industry. Um, I'm also going to look at some of the challenges that are out there in the industry at the moment, look a little bit forward into the future for what employment prospects are, um, and then uh, wrap it up then. So firstly, looking at construction output and the overall output of the construction industry. So looking back at 2012 and forward into 2013, um, this, is a, this is a graph that many of you may have seen before. Um, the left-hand side is the construction output in billions. The, the dates are ac across the bottom from 2000 up till now. Um, the horizontal line is a line which could represent what a stable and sustainable construction industry output might be. Um, construction industry output is often kind of thought to be around 12% of GNP. Um, that would put output at around 15 billion as a logical place for construction output to be uh, in the Irish economy. Uh, the, li the lines on the graph that go up show how the industry grew and grew uh, peaking in 2007, 2008 at over 35 billion, and then it shows the decline in output over the last number of years um, down to where we are now in 2012, 2013, around about 7.5 billion. So what that indicates very clearly is that for, for a period, our construction output was at unsustainably high levels. Um, what it also indicates, though, is that it's currently at unsustainably low levels of, uh, of output. So looking at some of the features of last year and looking ahead to this year, um, the, the construction output is still declining slightly. We're saying that it might decline by around 3.25% in 2013. Um, but when you think of the level of decline over the last number of years, that's a fairly stable level. Uh, it's still well short of the 15 billion target. Um, this, the industry, though it's probably more stable now than it has been the last couple of years, does still have fairly dysfunctional features to different elements of it. Tender prices are erratic. Um, there, are, there are things changing in the industry now that are inevitably going to have an impact. Material prices are starting to increase. Um, oil and gas products, obviously, the price of those have gone up. Um, public sector spending is continuing to fall. Housing output, currently at around six to 7,000 units a year, peaked at around 80,000. And then looking forward to some of the things that are going to influence the industry over the next couple of years. Um, NAMA being the biggest private property holder 
in the in the country. It's going to have a massive impact. Um, and then the, the renewed government stimulus package. So I'm going to look in some detail at some of those. So this is just looking at these lines in, again, a bit more detail. The construction output, 12% of GMP. You see in this version of the, we have the, uh, the line increasing slightly. That's, in, that's showing how it should increase. If GNP is increasing at, say, 2% per annum, the, the construction output should continue to increase as well. Um, that's, where we, that's where we are now, where we've been. And that's what 10% growth per annum would do for us. 10% um, growth per annum, obviously, would be doubling our construction output to get to the, the 15 billion mark. So you're talking 10 years to get to the 10 years of constant growth to get to the, that sustainable level. Um, if we if we hit, manage to hit 15% per annum of growth, we'd be there just before 2020. And while that seems like, in some ways, you look at that and say, "God, that's an awful long way off to get to a sustainable level." That's showing 10% year-on-year growth. So it's just showing how much growth there could be uh, and how much potentially there is over the next number of years. So what does 10% growth look like? Um, so 10%, if we're at around 7.5 billion at the moment, 750 million would be 10% growth in construction output. So if you look at this selection of projects, it's the kind of equivalent of all these projects starting in one year. Obviously, they'd take a number of years to complete. But that's the kind of scale of the level of increase that we need to see uh, to see that 10% growth. So then looking at, looking at these 10% and 15% options, uh, how realistic are they? Uh, against a falling public sector capital program, public sector capital program is going down again this year and next year. Um, but then you've got positive signs, like you've got the NAMA investment. There's two billion in NAMA investment planned over the next four years. Uh, there's NAMA vendor finance, another two billion. Stimulus package, another two billion. So in those sorts of contexts, you can see it being realistic. Um, and then I think the big question for us all, um, for the people active in the industry at the moment and for the students coming through, is will the industry be able to respond to that type of growth and how will it respond? So let's have a look about the, the, uh, the public sector capital program. So this is fairly fixed now. We, we have a pretty good handle on where this is going to be for the next number of years. Um, and 2013, 3.44 4 billion, then a 6% reduction in 2014 then fairly level. Um, and you can see from the graphs the large areas of spending. Um, you see transport, sport, and tourism, environment are the bigger ones. What this graph shows is how, where the changes lie in the public sector program. Um, so the green being the 2012 spending and the purple being the 2013 spending. So what you can see there is that most of them are fairly steady. In fact, kind of health and education showing slight increases. Where there's a big decline is the first column there, which is the transport, tourism, and sport. So that's primarily um, roads and uh, infrastructure on the transport side, which we'll see um, a dip. Then the, the other side of capital investment is the capital investment that comes through the, the semi-state bodies. Um, and you can see here, again, that there's significant capital investment in semi-state bodies. Not all of that is construction. Um, but there is, a, there is ongoing investment there. Then looking at the, the government stimulus package. In July, this um, 2.2 billion government stimulus package was announced. Um, it contained a lot of schemes that have already been announced several times before, um, and I had a fair degree of skepticism about it. Um, what it identified is this two and a quarter billion, um, 1.4 billion of non-exchequer funding, so that's private funding coming in through PPP projects, and then 0.35 and 0.5 of, of, um, of state funding, giving a, an intention of around 13,000 jobs. Um, as I say, I was fairly dubious about it. A lot of these projects have been announced before, but I think the key thing is that these projects aren't in the public sector capital program. So these are in addition to the public sector capital program. Um, and you can see there the range of schemes that are, that are identified. Um, and a good few of them are, um, are in the west or around Galway. One of the Garda divisional headquarters is identified for the site over the road. Uh, the N1718 Gort Tum Road um, is one of them. A number of the primary care centres are in Westport and Claremorris and places like that. So 
Um, that uh, stimulus package has a real timetable on it. Now, this is the this is the, the NDFA timetable that they have on these projects. Um, you can see SB4, SB5 are schools bundles. Um, the PCCs are the primary care centers, then the Grange Gorman, the Garda HQs, and the courts. All these projects are real projects now. We're bidding for the technical advisor roles on a number of these at the moment. Um, so there are consultancy appointments immediately coming through on these. Um, you see the big blue box, the first blue box is there, PQQ, that's the contractor pre-qualification, um, and then the various tender stages going forward. So a lot of these won't actually hit site till 2015, but they are already generating activity in the industry. Um, and I think anecdotally, if you talk to quite a number of people in the industry, consultants are starting to feel a bit of this additional work coming through. Uh, contractors still probably at much the same level because th that work won't follow through to them for some time. But, um, but obviously it's positive that it is coming. So part of, the, um, part of this public-private partnership is that it will need private equity, private funding to, um, to drive these schemes forward. Um, and the European Investment Bank will play a key role in this. In order to bring the, the private funding from the banks and so on, uh, like Bank of Ireland have funded a number of them, but they need the parallel investment of the European Investment Bank, which is um, the European Community Bank. So what have, what have they done over the last number of years? Well, 2.7 billion have been lent to uh, on Irish projects uh, in the last five years. Um, seismic amount in energy and transport, seismic amount not necessarily construction related through um, SMEs, uh, through the banks. Uh, and then an amount in health and education, that's in schools bundles, and in uh, education projects in UCD and other places. And then looking forward, uh, there's 100 million committed to schools, um, there's 500 million approved for board gosh for the, uh, the N17-18 again, and so on. And then more coming down the road. So the European Investment Bank will be key to unlocking some of the private funding that will be coming from other places. Then, then looking at, at NAMA, uh, as I say, NAMA are the, the largest uh, land holder and loan holder, uh, so they're going to have a big impact, and they're nearly going to control the private uh, development side over the next number of years. So this is, back to our, this is back to our graph, and the shaded in area being the area that needs to, the, the new work that needs to come out to, um, to, for us to, to get back to that sustainable level. So... That's what two billion over four years would do from now um, to making a dent in that. So you can see the, uh, the two billion investment could start to have an impact. Um, so what are NAMA doing? They're, what they're doing is they're identifying where they've got projects which can be developed and can effectively developed and can effectively get a return. Um, there is a good element of it going on in Dublin in the kind of the, the uh, central Dublin office market. Um, but there are schemes and there are housing schemes all over the country now that are being unlocked, where NAMA are funding the schemes being finished out and they'll go on the market. So at least there are, some of that work is starting to trickle through. Uh, and again, a lot of those schemes are complex schemes. They've got compliance issues. They've got planning issues. Um, and there's work for consultants <laughs> sorting out that sort of, those sorts of issues. Um, there will be work from a construction point of view as well, um, but it's, it's coming a bit further down the line. And I suppose the positive thing is that once these schemes happen, are completed, and they're sold, that money goes back into NAMA to can be used to refinance um, further elements. So the other, the other, area, um, sorry, the other area that NAMA is, um, has committed to spending on is the, uh, the vendor finance, which is, which is lending money to people prepared to invest in taking over their properties. So they have, again, committed $2 billion over four years in vendor finance. Um, so again, that will give people the ability to, to purchase their, their schemes. A lot of this will probably be um, property rather than development opportunity, um, and also on the mortgage side, that they are funding this. And again, that's, that's more money that will be coming into the market. One of the things that I think a number of other countries have had, but Ireland hasn't up until recently, is these REITs, real, invest, real estate investment trusts. Um, 
they make a, they make a tax efficient um, and a flexible way of, um, for bodies and individuals to invest in property and in property portfolios. So legislation has been passed now to make those um, possible in Ireland and that will assist NAMA in, in selling some of its property portfolios. It will also assist investors in getting involved in investment. Um, so again, it will um, <coughs> free things up somewhat. The other area where we're seeing quite a lot of activity is in the, the foreign direct investment. Uh, and this kind of simple chart, all we did here was we took the, the jobs announcements off the IDA website over 2012, and just to get a sense of what sectors they're in and what geographies they're in. So you see the sectors that are identified, IT, financial, pharma, and other. Uh, and you see the, across the top the, the geographies, so GDA, Greater Dublin, BMW, Border Midlands and Western, Midwest and Southern. So it does show some things that are very interesting that you can see 47% of the jobs announced have been in the IT sector. Um, and I presume that would include Google and those sorts of, um, those sorts of businesses. Um, which is interesting because you, you might think that pharma would be one of the strongest areas for growth but it's interesting that nearly 50% of it is in the IT sector. Um, and then you look at the, um, you look at the, the locations where it's happening, uh, and 50% of it in um, Greater Dublin. It's probably what you'd expect. BMW, quite high at 23, then the Midwest and the South are struggling more. BMW would include Galway, um, but it would go right across. It would include Dundalk as well and places like that. So that's another area where there is, um, there is certainly activity. So I suppose what I'm, I'm trying to portray is that whilst it is a very, very tough environment um, that everybody's working in, there are some elements there that haven't been there over the last number of years which should lead to uh, some increase in construction output. And I think we're already seeing that on the consulting side of things, and I think as time goes on, it will be seen more on the contracting side of things. Um, what have also flagged here in some of the slides are some of the, the big challenges that are out there for the industry. Uh, and these are um, some fairly nitty-gritty points, but they're things that are, are preoccupying a lot of time um, across the industry at the moment. And they're things which I think could be improved um, by some closer focus uh, and some changes across the industry. So looking at a number of areas, statutory th approvals, public procurement, low tenders, bonds, resources, and disputes. So, Firstly, the statutory approvals. I mean, it's incredibly frustrating uh, that the planning process continues the way that it has, that you can still appeal to Onboard Planola if you've got 250 euros, and if you do that, it can delay a project for six to nine months, even if there's a positive outcome at the end of it. Um, and at a time when the industry is crying out for projects, and there are some very real projects that could be progressing that are just stuck sitting in, um, sitting in planning, uh, and that's an area which I think there have been some changes, but is a, is a frustration to many. Um, public procurement has become very costly. It's become costly for bidders. It's become costly for authorities. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, it's also become very, very cost-focused. So it has encouraged, to some degree, a race for the bottom in terms of prices, both from uh, contractors and from consultants. Um, and that has... Um, it has had a detrimental effect on the industry. Um, performance bonds are all public sector projects and many <coughs> private sector projects require contractors to provide a performance bond. Um, bonds of up to 25% have been the norm uh, up until now. The market has just um, moved completely away from 25% bonds. It's very hard to get bonds of over 10% anymore. Um, and again, the industry just needs to recognize that that's the new reality. And I think the... Um, Department of Public Expenditure and Reform is now kind of accepting that the 25% bonds are a thing of the past. Um, but again, that can slow projects down. Um, I think the resources is the key area that, um, that we might take away today as to, as to the challenges that are there for, for many of the, the bodies that are here. That um, The industry is at the lowest level in terms of people working in it in terms of the number of specialists involved, uh, the number of contractors in the market. So any change, any increase in output is going to need to be managed very well and very carefully. Um, 
the, and it's obviously an impact for the colleges as well with the number of students coming through and, uh, and balancing the current depressed state of the industry with the likely state of the industry in three or four years' time. Disputes, the, uh, the, the industry has brought about high level of, the, the level of competitiveness in the industry has brought a high level of disputes. Um, the new forms of government, forms of contract, um, don't make that any easier. They do move people towards disputes. Um, and I think if we are going to be able to, to, to grow the industry, we are going to need to get back more back to a more partnering approach towards construction. Uh, and again, I think people are starting to look at that and starting to recognize it. So going back to, uh, going back to this graph and our 10% or 15%, uh, I suppose the positive thing is they're both they're consistently across the industry. I think people are saying that there has to be growth over the next period. Um, and again, coming back to this point about the, the resources and the output that's there, um, the Society of Chartered Surveyors Ireland published this last year the, the graduate employment trends in construction and property surveying. Um, it was very much looking ahead to the issues that are going to confront us in the future, and in some cases already confronting us. Um, this is a graph that's extracted directly from it. Uh, the, the red line shows um, the, the numbers of construction graduates that are coming out of the colleges uh, over the next number of years, and it only goes up to 2014. Um, and the blue line indicates the kind of the level of potential uh, construction employment demand. Um, and I suppose what it does just does indicate quite graphically is that as, um, as the number of people coming out of colleges is going down, the demand is going to go up. Uh, so that is a clear, um, clear position that we're going to need to address. Um, this is another graph that's extracted directly from it. Um, and it again shows kind of employment in the construction industry at the peak in 2007. Uh, and it shows the different levels of seniority, the senior, junior, graduate, and admin. Uh, and, what, and the graduate is the green line. So what it shows there is that out of all the areas, it's the graduate level that's going to jump when things start picking up. So, um, so we need to watch that. So these are just a couple of quotes. In 2012, a number of members of the society began to, to voice their increased struggle to find qualified graduate surveyors to fill vacancies, uh, I think particularly on the property side. Uh, at the same time, members working in academic institutions reported a severe reduction in the number of students enrolling on surveying courses. Um, and the recent decline in the number of graduates entering the construction sector is very concerning. We need to ensure the brightest and best come into the sector to meet the new and complex challenges facing the con professional construction services firms across international markets. So I think that is, um, that's an area that we need, to, uh, we need to think about as well. So those are, that's a quick canter through um, through the industry in terms of output and the industry in terms of some of the challenges that are out there. Um, thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll hand you on back to Mark.